Welcome to the programme. Vladimir Putin has claimed a landslide victory in Russia's stage-managed presidential election. Indeed, the outcome of the vote was never in doubt, with an independent Russian monitoring group describing the vote as the most corrupt in the country's history. The election followed one of the harshest crackdowns on the Russian opposition in years. Most of the president's rivals are dead, in jail or in exile. Well, let's start with a little of Vladimir Putin's victory speech after the results came in. We have many tasks ahead of us, but when we are united, I think it has become clear to everyone that no matter how much they want to intimidate us, no matter how much they want to suppress our will and consciousness, no one in history, as I have already said, has ever succeeded at anything of the sort. It has not worked now and will not work in the future. Never. And to talk about Putin's new term in office, I'm pleased to welcome to the program now Alexander Titov. He's a lecturer in contemporary Russian history and politics at Queen's University in Belfast. Hello to you, sir. Thanks for joining us. Hello. What, in your view, does this new term for Putin mean, first of all, for the war in Ukraine? Because Putin did speak yesterday about this idea of a buffer zone in Ukraine. Uh, yes. So uh, I think that's one of the uh, kind of key uh, themes, of course, is is the war in Ukraine uh, and more broadly relations with the with the West. Uh, the issue of the buffer of the zone, of course, was coming against the uh, kind of quite substantial military operation by uh, by Ukrainian forces up to um, three to four five thousand uh, troops were trying to uh, attack Russia proper, the Belgorod region, which is uh, there's about 80 kilometers between second largest city in Ukraine, Kharkov, and the uh, Russian city of Belgorod, which were founded around the same time back in the 17th century. Anyway, uh, they were trying to kind of humiliate uh, Putin, kind of having this ma major incursion in Russia proper territory. It failed so far, but it still exposed uh, the vulnerability of uh, particularly Belgorod, this, the largest city nearest to the Ukrainian border, to potential attacks, both uh, land forces and also the shelling. So I think that's what they're talking about to kind of remove this vulnerability and push the buffer zone so far in the uh, in around uh, Belgorod region. However, more broadly, the issue of um, uh, the war and where we will conclude is, is certainly one of the key elements in uh, for, for Putin facing the next six years, because, you know, it's clear that, you know, they, they never expected it to be so long and so bloody uh, when he started the invasion. So uh, so how it will go out, we'll, we'll see. But uh, so far in this election, 2024, things are looking much better for Russia on the, on the front uh, than uh, they, they were last year. Uh, so um, in that sense, he's uh, he's confident. And, in, and also, arguably, things are looking better for Putin himself, given this landslide election win, although clearly, you know, independent monitors, Russian and foreign, saying this wasn't a free election, it wasn't a fair election. Do you think, though, it's fair to say that Putin has broad popular support in Russia? Domestically, people are relatively happy with him. Can we make that analysis? Well, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a complex question. First of all, you know, Putin been there for about uh, 25 years now, a quarter of a century. People just used to them. You know, for uh, a lot of people, uh, they don't know anybody else. The key here is also that, you know, they managed so far, uh, surprisingly uh, well, separate uh, people, daily life of majority of people uh, from the, from, uh, from the, what's going on in, in, in Ukraine. So you have this term of special military operation. If most people, actually, life hasn't changed uh, that much unless you live on the border regions like Belgorod or been drafted into the army, uh, which is, again, really reasonably a small number of people. So uh, in that sense, uh, yes, uh, the issue of stability, issue of reason, the, the, the life actually has certainly been better since uh, the 1990s. Uh, the economy has been stagnating for um, you know, quite a number of years, almost 10 years now. But on the other hand, uh, it's stagnating at a reasonably high level of um, uh, living standards. Uh, and the sanctions, Western sanctions, hasn't really changed that much. I mean, certainly they changed a lot, you know, speaking from, um, you know, 
talking to lots of people, you know, the biggest change is that the Western cars have left and the Chinese um, manufacturers come in and replace them. Uh, so not everybody particularly happy about that. But, you know, on the other hand, you know, you just get on with your life as long as you, you know, don't have to um, go to front if you if you don't want to. And most people uh, are like that. So, so in that sense, support for him uh, is um, tacit. Uh, Opposition, the open, going in open position is dangerous, and the life is not uh, as as bad as um, uh, as you can imagine. So, um, so yeah, uh, in that sense, he's he's safe. Look, it's good to talk to you, Alexander Titov. Thank you very much indeed for your thoughts today. Thank you. Now, in the context of the Russian elections, my colleague Julia Seeger has been looking at efforts to disconnect Russia from the World Wide Web, or in the language of the Kremlin, to establish a sovereign Russian internet. It's quite an idea, and uh, Julia is with me now to explain. So, Julia, just tell us what this is all about. Well, for several years now, Russia has been trying to disconnect from what we know as the Internet, the World Wide Web. Uh, it's a tool that was created in 1991 by a certain scientist, and it was really conceived as an open and universal space for uh, information to be able to flow freely and without interference. And it was probably a very overly optimistic view there of uh, what was possible. Now, some countries today actually don't want to be part of that anymore. So Russia, but also China, North Korea, they want a sovereign internet, as you said. So they want to have more control over the infrastructure, the data, but also all of the information that flows within uh, their country. And this phenomenon of the internet fragmentation, as we called, is now known as the splinternet, where the rules and the technology at the core of the internet would change from one region or one country to another. Now, the quest in Russia to begin to create what we know now as the RUNET uh, started in 2019 when Vladimir Putin voted several laws. They're known as the Internet Sovereignty Laws, and they required uh, local internet providers and government websites to all be hosted within Russia and all of the technology to be controlled uh, by Russia. So they want to be able to disconnect from the internet as they wish, but they also want to be able to do so if a foreign country, for instance, pulls the plug on them as well. Now, several months ago, Ukraine actually asked for the international association that is in charge of all the domain names to unplug and to disconnect Russia from the internet. They refused to do so because they would open, of course, a Pandora's box mm -hmm. and they can't be politically motivated. I find this such an interesting story, Julia. And as I understand it, the Russians have already conducted a number of tests on this sort of sovereign internet. That's right. They conducted cybersecurity uh, exercises involving banks, but also uh, telecom operators. They were able to do so from what we understand, but we just don't know for how long they were able to disconnect from the World Wide Web. So they're doing so for geopolitical reasons. They're scared indeed that someone's going to pull the plug, but they're also doing it because there's more and more cyber attacks on Russian territory. There's a hot war in cyberspace today. You have many countries that have changed their cybersecurity doctrine to a more offensive one to be able to uh, really preserve their interests. So they see a sovereign internet, these countries like China, Russia, but also North Korea, they see a sovereign internet as the possibility to reduce uh, potential espionage or political interference, but also, and more importantly, as really a way to make sure that they have control over the information that is flowing in their country, because it would mean that they would, that people in Russia wouldn't be connected to international sources, for instance. But in practice, Julia, it's obviously not quite that simple to just no, disconnect actually, from the World Wide Web. Right, and we're actually really far from it. You don't mm. have a parallel internet today. Russia, for instance, and China still use the internet as we know it, but they use firewalls, if you will. And people in those countries tend to use VPNs to be able to bypass that. Now, China is investing massively to uh, create its own network. It's going to be more difficult for Russia because you have to have control over certain technologies like microprocessors, for instance. And unfortunately, or maybe not, unfortunately, but it's difficult to find suppliers that are not connected at all to the United States today. It's worth emphasising, though, you mentioned Russia, obviously, you've mentioned China as well, that other countries are also trying to think about how they can better control their own digital sovereignty. Everyone in the world is trying to regain digital sovereignty. So, for instance, in Europe, they've been trying to develop a sovereign cloud, if you will. The cloud is where we put all of our information, all of our strategic information linked to our more, most strategic companies. And what they want to do here is they want to ex escape what we call uh, U.S. extraterritorial laws, which pretty much state that if data uh, are going to flow through data, U.S. data centers 
even if it's not on U.S. territory, it's still considered as U.S. territory, and hence it falls under their jurisdiction. So they, pre they can pretty much use all of this data. And of course, that opens the door to political espionage, industrial espionage, mass surveillance. That's also what Edward Snowden revealed. And uh, of course, the U.S. does it, but of course, Russia, China also does it. Many countries within the cyberspace are spying, attacking, disrupting in one way or another. So it's still the Wild West. We're seeing this fragmentation of the internet happening, and that's going to have consequences on the free flow of information on an international level. Such an interesting story. Thank you very much. Julia Seeger, for us there.